So my alarm went off at 5 a.m. on June 11th, 2007. And I was really nervous. Uh, I didn't sleep the night before, uh, anticipating this day in the history of my life. I got up, uh, I had a little bit of breakfast, grabbed my phone, I began to text my family and my friends, and I was letting them know that I was going to just be off grid for a little while. Some of them knew what was going on in my life, and some of them uh, didn't. And I hopped in my car, and I drove all the way from uh, the Marietta area um, to North Point Mall in Alpharetta. I parked my car in a parking garage, and I stood and sat in my car going, huh, huh, how long am I going to be in there? I get out of my car, I walk through uh, the doors, and uh, as I walk into the, the doors of North Point Mall, Star 94 um, stuff is all over the place. Uh, today was the day for me. I was entering into the wheel world, Star 94's contest, live in a car to win it contest in 2007. <laughs> it was a pretty scary ordeal for me. One, um, it was the decision on my life to decide to sit in a car for possibly 31 days uh, to win it. Uh, there was two cars. There was eight total contestants, uh, four contestants in each car. The rules were crazy. No cell phones in the car, no books, no paper, just you, your friends, <laughs> a webcam, a microphone, and Star 94 music pay playing 24 hours a day. It was incredible. Let me show you some pictures of the real world. So hey, this is just um, us. We we're going to win a 2008 Mercury Mariner. Keep going. Some of my friends, look at that guy, man. Come on. I look young and skinny and great. Um, yeah, it was great. I was just getting interviewed before we hopped into uh, the vehicle, repping my FCA gear. That's us in the vehicle. You see, like, they're all five foot one, and I'm like seven feet tall. Like, that's just not fair to begin with. Yeah, I'm sad. Um, I'm like the, the bear you see at a zoo, you know, like, get me out of here. Everybody just looking at us. We played different games throughout the time where we would win prizes or, or, or win different elements of the game. Uh, I lost that one. My feet began to stink really bad on day six, and so I was like, I'm going to do you all a favor on my 10-minute break and wash my feet. Um, we did a 500-piece puzzle. I hate puzzles, by the way, and so because I hate puzzles, I decided just to sleep during the puzzle-making <laughs> time and let somebody win the puzzle game. And that's me at the very end interviewing with, I think that's Steve and Vicky, or I don't know, one of the two. Uh, I don't know if this afternoon show or not. It, it, was, it, was a, it was a crazy season for me. And yes, I wanted to win a car. Like, right? Who wouldn't? But for me, walking into this contest was way more, about a, way more about than just a car. It was about a mission for me. See, I, when I was 13 years old, I, I came home from church one day, and I asked my dad, man, how do you become a believer in Jesus? And he said, I don't know. We called the pastor over. The pastor sat with me. He told me about Jesus and his love for me. And I said, I want to I be a part of that. And, and for me in the next season of my life, probably the next several years of my life, me and my relationship with Jesus looked very simple. It was Jesus coming out of heaven, right, and just sitting next to me, spending time with me. Because I had a lot of built-up emotions. I had a lot of built-up preconceived notions. I had a lot of built-up pain and questions. And my nights and my evenings were spent on my bed, whether it was reading my Bible or just staring up on the glow-in-the-dark stars that were on my ceiling. And I began to ask Jesus, like, why am I in this mess? And for me and my relationship with Jesus, it was vital for me and Jesus just to have this, this time together. And so for me, going into a car contest, you're all like, Ryan, really? Like, you're going to make this switch? For me, going into the car contest, my thought process was, and I'm going to jump into these, the car with these people. Either they all freak out because I'm in love with Jesus and I win a car, <laughs> and they leave the contest, or I have an opportunity with them like Jesus had with me. A couple questions for you this morning. What has Jesus done in your life? How did he rescue you? What have you seen him do, or how has he shown up? What have you seen Jesus do in the people's lives around you? And here's the vital question this morning. Are you willing to replicate it? Are you? Am I? 
Am I willing to replicate what I've seen Jesus do in others and what he's done in my own life? Can I pray with you guys real quick? Jesus, thank you so much for these people, for this church, for this place. And I pray, Jesus, that you'll begin to interpret my words and your scripture into the hearts of these people, that you'll speak life into every single one of us individually. I pray, Jesus, that, that I, although we all may want to have a, a lasting legacy, a domino effect in our lives, I pray, Jesus, that you give us these tangible ways that you've shown up in our life and the life of other people. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament. We'll be in chapter 3. The verses will be on the screen as well, or you can look it up in the YouVersion app. In Acts chapter 3, Jesus had left the scene just a, a few previous chapters before. This is the second part of Luke's book. So you have the, 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 the book of Luke, and then now the same author is actually the book of Acts. Jesus had been away from his disciples, I don't know, several weeks, a couple months. It hasn't been that long. And then Peter and John are kind of walking into a prayer meeting. They're walking into the temple at a time of prayer. We catch up in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame, a man who was crippled from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. I want to pause for a second. This is, this is huge news for us, that, that this man had been crippled since birth. Like, this man had never walked before. He had never had his first toddler steps where everybody's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, he's going to die. He's going to fall over. His head's too big. Like, he had never had that moment. It wasn't this tragic accident that kind of messed him up and, and he relived the days of walking. This man had never walked before. And every day, his friends, his family, his neighbors, some randos on the street would pick him up on the mat and set them at this gate. This was his life. This was his hope. Can you just give me a couple silver coins? Just, just, just a few gold ones? I need to feed myself. I need to feed my family, can, can you just help me out? And the scripture says he did this every day. This is where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. A ton of questions for us this morning. What would you do if we had a beggar outside of our doors and he showed up or she showed up every day? What would you do? Would you just turn around and leave? Would you tell one of us? Would you give them money? And the next Sunday, and the next Sunday night, and the next opportunity, he was just there. This was this man's reality. And he was at a gate called the special gate. Now, in, in Jewish culture, and even in the temple, there were 10 different gates that you could enter into the temple. So it would be like us having 10 different entrances uh, into our building. Nine of them were good, and one of them was beautiful, right? Which gate would you walk through, <laughs> right? I mean, most people would probably walk through the beautiful gate, and the other nine gates were made of silver and gold, which you'd be like, that's beautiful. What is going on with these people? But the one gate called the beautiful gate was made out of this bronze copper that discolored over time and just had this reflection of colors. And so this man was, was sitting at the most beautiful entrance into the temple, maybe he knew the most beautiful entrance would be the most trafficked entrance, and, and he began to sit there. Jews have three pillars of their faith. One is the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. They memorized it. They meditated on it. They knew God's word, and that was really important to them. And number two was worship and prayer. This may sound similar to maybe your priorities in your faith, but it was worship and prayer, they love to worship God together and pray. And then this, the third piece was this charity piece, this, this alms piece. And we may go, look, that's, okay, cool. There's this scripture piece, there's this worship piece, and then really, God, you expect us to put coins in our pocket every Sunday morning, and as we walk into church, give it out to, to people who are, who are maybe less than us. And if you really look at the character of God, it makes quite sense, Right? I mean, God's in the business of giving hope to the hopeless. God uses those people that aren't just extravagant and perfect and well put together and, and iron shirts. Like, he cares for those way less than we care for. 
And so he's going, hey, if I care about those people who are, are deemed as trash or unworthy or less than, if, if I love them and if I'm willing to pursue them, maybe you, maybe I, maybe us as a church should do the same. And so uh, in the early church, when people would go into the temple, they would literally get up, put coins in their pockets, and as they walked into the temple, I don't know how they did it, like they flipped coins to the people begging for money. It's, it's a wild switch from us. If you're anything like me, when somebody asks me for money, my first thing I do is I look at the ground. Like, I didn't see you. You didn't see me. Like, what is going on? Or maybe we drive too fast. Or maybe we go, oh, we'll get you next time. But it's, it's, a, it's a vast difference from us to them. And, yes, our world is vastly different. Just last week, I don't know if any of you guys saw this, but I was in the Brookstone Kroger parking lot, and as I was getting some groceries, I came out. And um, I see a man playing a violin in the parking lot. I don't know if you, any of you guys saw this last week. And it's this beautiful violin music. And I was drawn to it. And, and I rarely ever give money to random people, but I was drawn to it. And so I drove by, and I had a $5 bill in my pocket. And as I drove closer to him, he had a sign. And his sign said something along the lines of, hey, we help, you know, feed me and my kids. He had one little boy in the parking lot playing with a little car, like in the parking lot street. But this man was playing beautiful violin music. And for me, I was drawn more to the music than really even the story, which is probably another, another sad thing to talk about. And, and I reached into my wallet, and, and I didn't even look him in the eye. I just kind of gave him the $5 and drove off. And as I did a U-turn in the parking lot, I saw him grab the money, and I, he put it in his pocket. But the weird thing was the music kept playing as he put his money in his pocket. So what really happened was he wasn't playing the violin. It was recorded. So I know we all have these jaded memories, these jaded things that, that we do, but, but, but Peter and John walk into this temple, and they're faced with the same situation you and, you and I are faced with every week. This man, who could not walk, sees Peter and John as they're coming in to a prayer meeting. And in verse 3, it says this, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. He, you got something? You got a little bit of something? It's kind of funny because Peter takes charge in this moment. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. I don't know if, like, Peter looks at him and John's looking at Peter and then realizes Peter's looking at the dude. And so he's like, I must look at the dude. And it's just kind of this weirder, okay, I'll do, you do. Okay, we're looking at this guy. And John's like, I hope he says something because I have nothing to say. I don't know what's going on. And then Peter says this. He goes, look at us. Look at me. Church, when is the last time you said that and it wasn't a derogatory statement? You better look at me right now and look at me when I'm talking to you, whether it's to your kids or your spouse. <laughs> but when is the last time you, you cared so much about someone and you just wanted to grab their cheeks like an old grandma would and go just, hey, look at me, darling. Just look at me. You are beautiful. No, 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 no. Look at me. You're beautiful. You are worth something. Look me in the, no, stop bowing your head. Just look at me because I care about you. I love you. You have this purpose in your life that you don't fully understand. Can you just look at me for a second? Like, like when my Riley, my four-year-old daughter, or my two-year-old son gets in trouble, like I get down on my knee and I just look at me real quick. Can you look at me in my eyes? Not because I want them to instill fear into their lives, so I can know, so they know that actually I care. And so Peter and John look at this man, and the first thing they say is, go, we look at me? And the scripture says, so the man gave him them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Sweet. If I look at you, but hey, for real, though, are you going to give me those coins? Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Again, imagine this scene. Homeless slash maybe lame man, been at the gates every day of his life, full of shame. He's been rejected over and over and over and over again. Hey, I'll get you next time, dude. I'll get you next prayer meeting, man. I, I, I got you. He's been rejected, and he's full of shame. And Peter and John, they lift up his head and say, may we look at me real quick? And just like you would expect, like, and I would expect, you'd be like, cool, all right, well, this, these dudes are for real. Like, they're actually spending time with me. I'm going to spend time with them, have this intimate conversation with them, but then they're still going to give me what I want. 
And John's looking at Peter probably going, bro, I don't have any cash. Did you bring cash? Because we're really just going to like say I pray for you, man, and walk away. And then Peter goes, dude, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And John's like, hold up. We didn't talk about this. <laughs> like we, we didn't, what's going on? Have, have you ever been in a conversation with someone? Been in a situation? And somebody's asking for your input and your advice, and you're going, dude, I have no idea what to do. Like, I don't. I don't. Like, I, I know you want me to say something, but, dude, I, I don't understand you, or I don't understand that situation, or no, I have never been there. I don't know what it's like. And Peter and John in the same situation that you and I face all the time, and Peter's going, dude, I don't get you. I've never been lame. I've always been able to walk. I, I don't have what you need, money, because I've never even been there, but, like, I can give you what Jesus has given me. I mean, Jesus kind of had the same instructions to his disciples, right? Hey, get up and walk. Come over here. Hey, dude, come on. Get over here. F come follow me. No, no, come now. He goes, I don't have what you really want, the coins, but I can give you what Jesus gave me. And, and Peter and John had seen Jesus do this several times. He saw Jesus heal a crippled man in Matthew 9, Mark 2, John 5. And, and just like you and I, they, they didn't just stop right there. Most of us would be like, hey, get up and walk. See ya. I hope he gets up. I hope he gets up. I hope he gets up. <laughs> right? You've been in the situation. Somebody pours their heart out to you, and you go, man, I'm going to pray for you. And you go home, and you never pray. You're a liar. <laughs> You never pray. Man, I'm going to be thinking about you. I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for the situation. And then you just go on with your life. Peter and John didn't just go, hey, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. But i got to go hit up this prayer session. When I get back, please don't be here. Because if you're here, you can still be on the mat probably. They partnered with the man. Peter and John, there's an exclamation point after Peter says, get up and walk. But the dude does not get up. In verse 7, it says, Peter, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and junking, jumping, hashtag skipping, <laughs> and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Peter and John didn't just go to them and tell them about the good news. Peter and John didn't just go to the man who was hurting, who was broken, who had no purpose for a life, and just give him some good truths or some characteristics of God. He didn't just go to the people and say, hey, memorize this verse. It's awesome. It'll be inspiring to you. What Peter and John actually did was they gave this man hope, like, in the name of Jesus, get up. I've seen my boy Jesus do this before. Get up. He doesn't get up. And Peter's like, all right, we're going to try. We're going to see how this works. And he stands him up and lets go. And he stays standing. He picks the man up. Now, I don't know if this dude was just so pumped, so excited, so full of joy that he starts running and skipping and shouting and singing. But he makes himself his, he makes himself, his way into the temple. And we'll see here in, in a few more minutes that he's right beside Peter and John. Peter and John don't just say, hey, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. They don't just pick him up and help him and partner with him. They bring him to church. Come with me. Our relationship's not over. I'm not just going to pray for you. I'm not just going to send you an encouraging Bible verse. I'm not just going to do a version Bible plan with you. Come with me as I worship and pursue my Jesus. Come with me and do it with me. I mean, this, this dude was pumped. He had never walked before. And he began to jump and run. When is the last time you skipped? Like, really? When is the last time that you were such full of joy and passion? I mean, Riley, my four-year-old daughter, Riley, keep bragging on her. We'll be walking, and she'll be like, Daddy, let's skip. I'm like, no, Daddy's not going to skip. We're in public. Like, we're not, we're not going to skip. You can skip, you know, or we can skip in the backyard, but we're not going to skip in Walmart aisle four. Like, we're not going to, 
skip here. But this man was excited. His life had just all changed. And the people around him were going, wait, hold up. Isn't that the dude that used to sit on the mat? Like, I've been giving him nickels. I've been giving him pennies for the last 30 years. Is that, is that the man? We all have people like that in our lives, right? We, we have the couple friends who are on the brink of divorce. We, we have negative Nancy in our office. We, we have that, that man who just won't step away from the addictive behavior, and everyone knows what's going on in their lives. Their judgments, reality, I don't know. We figure that out. But there's different people in our lives that we can look at and get mug shots of and go, yep, he is this. Hey, she does that. Oh, this is her go-to. Oh, this is what he does. And church, what would it look like if we began, if you began to replicate what Jesus has done in your life, how he's rescued you, how he saved you, how, how he's spoke, spoken truth and worth into your life, what would it look like if we began to replicate that in the lives of other people? And then those other people begin to take charge of their own faith. I mean, what if your friend circle was like, wait, didn't she used to? And you'd be like, yeah, 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 she used to. <laughs> she used to not could walk. She used to struggle on walking out on, on, on her husband. Yeah, he, he used to struggle with this, and he used to spend money on that, but then him and then she and Jesus collided. A big crowd gathered, and Again, John's like, Peter, you take over. I, I don't know what's going on here. In verse 11, it says, well, the, the man held on to Peter and John, like a little child around their leg. All the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk. People gather around. The biggest excuse you could probably give me this morning is like, dude, Brian, I'm just, I'm just not there yet with my relationship with Jesus. Like, I have faith. If I die, I'm going to heaven because I believe in Jesus. Like, you're asking me to actually, like, be active in my faith. Like, I'm just not there yet. I don't know enough scripture, Ryan. I only come to church a couple times a month, Ryan. I don't really pray that often, and if you were to walk beside me the other six days of the week, you'd probably judge me and probably tell me, no, just go be you and do you, and don't bring Jesus into it. But Peter and John say this statement that rocks our world. And he goes, why does this surprise you? It's not because I'm godly. It's not because I'm a disciple of Jesus. It's not because I walked with Jesus and saw Jesus do these things. It's not because Jesus is my best friend. The reason this happened is because my faith, but then God did it all. I had the faith, but God did the miracle. Your faith can change the faith in other people. Your faith, your active faith, not just your verbal faith, your active faith can change the faith in other people. I mean, think about it. We so often maybe go toe-to-toe -to -toe with our family, with our spouse, with our kids, and, man, you just need to believe. Why can't you just believe in Jesus? Come on, can't, why can't you just get it? And we try to convert them. We, we try to convince them. And, and the reality of the situation is, is Peter and John are going, dude, I did none of that. Do you realize this man never professed Jesus, the lame guy? Like, Peter and John didn't ask the man, hey, look, if you really want to get healed, if you really want your marriage to change, hey, if you really want this addiction to go away, hey, if you really want the relationships that are broken in your life to be mended, um, first, okay, step one, can, we, can you profess Jesus as your Savior? Go ahead. Okay, yeah. And now, now let's pray. Cool. All right, get up and walk now. That's not what Peter and John did. They didn't wait for this man to actually believe in Jesus before this man was healed. And you better believe, we don't know, but the scripture says that he was skipping around praising Jesus or praising God. Your faith, your active faith, 
can change the faith of your spouse, can change the faith of your kids, your coworkers, your neighbor. The most unhealthiest relationships that you have, your act of faith can change their faith. And maybe you and I, we need to stop worrying about putting the perfect verse on social media or sending them the perfect text about how Jesus spoke to you today and what he told you to eat for breakfast, something weird. But maybe, just maybe, you and I can meet people's needs like Jesus met yours. And in that interaction, in that collision, maybe, just maybe, your coworkers, your spouse, your kids, maybe you will start skipping again. Peter and John saw a need right in front of them. A person that they'd probably seen before, walked by before, maybe given a silver coin before. And they did something about it. Are you willing to replicate what Jesus has done in your life? I didn't win the car. I was in there for 13 days, 24 hours a day. I had my WWJD bracelet on. I had an FCA t-shirt on, but I didn't really talk about my faith for the first two or three days. Just like Jesus was to me, where Jesus just sat beside me and heard my cry and heard my frustration. I just sat beside, and if you sit in a car with people for 24 hours a day, stuff comes out. And I began just to sit there and listen. And I began to share about my life and my Jesus and what I've learned. And as day four turned into day 13, I decided, man, my time, my time is done. Two people had not come back after their 10-minute break. One was voted off the island on the day of the, the next vote, I, I felt really good going in to the vote, but I felt like my purpose was much larger than just a car. So on air, in epic fashion, I opened the door in mid-interview and I walked out of the vehicle. And Steve and Vicki, they, they interviewed me on stage and they go, Ryan, why did you leave? I said, hey, I came here for a, a purpose. I came here for a mission. I wanted people not to give up on Jesus like I almost did. I wanted people to get a different picture of the Jesus that I fall in love with. I think my time is done here and off to FCA summer camp I go. And in that moment, I'm going, man, I hope this worked. Like, was it even, you know, have you had those moments where you're like, was this even worth it? Did they get it? I think I was this way, but... Remember Jessica, she ended up winning the vehicle. She grabbed the mic and she goes, hey, I'd given up on church. This is all live on air. She goes, I'd given up on church. I was judged. I had an older boyfriend in youth group and people judged me and I gave up. I'm never walking back in, but, but I'm going to give church a second shot. Cindy, she was the runner-up. She's about a 45-year-old mom. She said, I, just, I never knew Jesus wanted a relationship with me. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, is it that easy? Yes, it was on a big stage, but is it that easy just to replicate what Jesus had done in my life? And there was an older woman, probably 60, standing out past the roped off section and she was holding a bag and we kept making eye contact. And at the very end, I walked off the stage and I opened the back of the car, grabbed my bag, and I began to walk out, and she looked at me, and she stopped me, and she goes, Ryan, and I go, yes, ma'am, do I know you? And she goes, no, no, you don't know me, but, but I was listening on the radio five or six days ago. You've changed my life. Five or six days before, I was in the vehicle, and I had this grand idea to preach out of the car. <laughs> Friday, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, somewhere around that time at North Point Mall. I had a couple of my buddies who I was discipling pass out flyers, and I stuck my head out of the vehicle. 
and preach the sermon. And I told them, you need, if you want to fall in love with Jesus, there's people out there. I can't get out of this car to pray for you. <laughs> but there's people in the audience that can and will. And she goes, I was, I was at the mall that day. And she goes, I have a relationship with Jesus, and I came here to bring you some cookies. <laughs> My tagline was, Jesus was in the grave for three. I was in the car for 13. <laughs> but church, you're going to have a domino effect. You're going to leave a legacy. We don't have to carry a cross down, you know, 41. We don't have to stand at an intersection with a billboard of a scripture or a memory verse. All you, all I, all we have to do is God has placed you on your street, in your job, in your home. Mom's at a Chick-fil-A with your kids. Like God, God has placed you there. And the people around you is on purpose. And are you willing to have that conversation? This is why I'm so passionate about neighboring. As you go to your mailbox, as you go get your trash can, as you go in your backyard to grill out, people are all around you. And are you going to be like Peter and John and ask those people around you, look right at me. No, no really, how is your day going? Look, look right at me. I know your husband's been out of town. How are you doing? Like, look right at me. I haven't seen your kids around. Like, are they okay? Look right at me. And not just, hey, I'm going to pray for you. But maybe you say, can I pray for you now? I don't encourage you to go walk around and try to find crippled people and ask them to get up and walk. But what I am asking you is those people that you see every day, every week, are you willing to stop, look at me, pick me up, and take me with you in church? If we decide to actually have an active faith, our active faith will change the faith of others. So there's dominoes all up here on the stage. We're going to play a worship song here in a second. And, and I want you just to, to ask God very clearly, God, who is the person or the people in my life that you place in front of me every day that maybe I dismiss, maybe I'll ignore Maybe it's going to be too long of a conversation if I stop and ask. But, but, but God, who are those people? And your commitment to God, not to me, but your commitment to God and him revealing that to you is to grab a domino and put it on your bathroom counter, right by your speedometer, on your car, in your wallet to make it uncomfortable. I don't know. But grab this domino or these dominoes and commit God, God, how you've had relationship and pursued me, I commit to have that same relationship with other people. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for stepping out of heaven to earth. Jesus, thank you for pursuing me, for finding me. Jesus, thank you so much for getting on my level, for picking me up, for lifting up my chin. Jesus, thank you for telling me that I'm worthy and that I'm enough. Jesus, I want to continue the mission. And so I pray, Jesus, that when I walk, I, I walk looking, actively looking for people who you set in my path. I pray, Jesus, that when I go home and I pull into my driveway, I actively look and pray and go, God, is where I live on purpose? And it is. So why am I here? Why do I live here? What do you need me to do? I pray that when we walk into the office tomorrow that we look with fresh eyes. Not with, man, my job's on the line. Not with, man, I got to play the game. I got to stay under the radar. 
Jesus, who have you placed in my path? And I pray, Jesus, that we become active in our faith. We don't just listen. We don't just say, I will. But you say, I will do now. I will pray for you now. I will help you now. And hey, come, come hang out with me at my house, at my church, at my group. And Jesus, we believe and we trust that you will cause a domino effect in our life, in this church, in our family, and in the city. In Jesus' name, amen.